part three, and hopefully the final part, because it's killing me, of this negotiating a real estate deal. In the first two parts, we talked about finding the property. We talked about contacting the realtor, and we went all the way through uh, tips and tricks on submitting an offer. So at this point, we have our offer submitted, and we're going to go ahead and go into our slides with what we need to do next. At this point, we're going to go ahead and visit the property if we're able to in person. That'll help us gauge anything we want to put on an inspection addendum. It'll also help us with any unseen repairs or fixes we're going to need to do before our tenant moves in. If you're not local, you can always have your realtor go by there and just uh, ask him or her to tell you what is bad and what's good about the property. Try to tell them, you know, focus on the bad there. A lot of times you'll have people walk through and they'll be like, oh, it's good, it's good, it's good. And they won't tell you anything bad about it. So make sure you're getting a good estimate of what's going wrong with the property. Every house has some sort of issue. You don't have a big roof with four walls around it and a bunch of electrical and plumbing and all that without some sort of problem. You just need to know this stuff so that when you have a tenant move in, you kind of know what's going to be going on when they're in there. You also need to know how long it's going to take before you can have your tenant move in. So when you visit the property, make sure you're taking a lot of pictures and video or make sure your realtor is taking a lot of pictures or video. And note the complications with anything that you see. Is something messed up? Are there two prong outlets? Uh, you notice I mentioned that a lot. Uh, is the bathtub really crappy or is the tile moldy and the pictures didn't show it before? Just note all that stuff. Take a notepad, put it in your phone in a notepad, put it somewhere so you can record it for later. So you might ask, why haven't we visited the property yet? Well, for everybody, it's different. Remember, this can't be investment advice. It can't be financial advice. I'm just a YouTuber. If you do anything that I say, you'll go ahead and lose all your money. You might as well just go ahead and uh, pull it out of the bank now, throw it in the river and watch it float away. Um, okay, so why haven't we visited the property yet? So when we submit the offer... We went ahead and submitted it because they said we're getting a three bed, one bath house. And we'll switch to it here. So they said we were getting this. We were getting all this here. They said three bed, one bath, 1,286 square feet, $130,000. We went ahead and agreed with them on 115,000. Hopefully that's what happened in this hypothetical situation. So when we walk through and there's some problems, we can come back and say, uh, hey, Mr. S Mrs. Seller or Mr. And Mrs. Realtor, um, you know, your, uh, your ad out there didn't say that all these windows were broken. It didn't say there was a leak in the roof. It didn't say that this vent here was bad. It didn't say that this wine cellar uh, was just kind of a pit in the ground below this uh, little hatch here. Um, and it didn't say that the deck was all rotted. So it gives you a little more negotiating power because in this one, this uh, video here, we're going to go ahead and start actually negotiating for the property. All right, back to our slide. So now that we're visiting the property, we're seeing everything that they didn't include in their ad because they're trying to sell you a house. So there's going to be all kinds of stuff you notice, you know, in that house. Uh, you know, maybe we didn't notice that the washer and dryer See if we can find that picture. Maybe we didn't notice that the washer and dryer was uh, kitchen, 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 kitchen. Where's it at? Come on, come on, kitchen. So maybe we didn't notice the washer and dryer was kind of sitting in the middle of the kitchen, and that's a problem. Maybe we didn't notice there's a leak under the sink when we were looking through it. You should notice all this stuff once you take a good look at the property. But you're going to come back at them and say, hey, you know, I thought I was getting a three-bed, one-bath house, uh, but, you know, you kind of got the uh, washer and dryer. Uh, eating dinner with us. So, you know, when uh, my tenant's three-year-old uh, tries to feed the uh, dryer his baby food, um, you know, that's going to be a problem. So uh, there's some work I have to do on this house to make it work out for me. Okay, good. So we have our purchase offer submitted. Now, um, we went ahead and put that uh, purchase agreement in. And uh, ideally, now that we're looking through the property, we don't come up with too much other stuff. But you notice uh, in the earlier videos, I mentioned make sure that the offer you put in that gets accepted fits your numbers because what ends up happening, sometimes you'll walk through a house 
and it'll be absolutely perfect with only little minor things, a little nick or ding there, uh, and you can't really get it repaired. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a few slides with our inspection and our inspection addendum that we're going to submit. But anyway, now that you're visiting the property, it gives you more stuff uh, to come back at them with when you're trying to negotiate the final price of the property. Keep that in mind. So now uh, I recommend to everybody I know that you get an inspection on every property. It's only uh, three to four hundred dollars. You know, it could go up to five hundred depending on how much you have them do get pest inspection, mold, uh, carbon monoxide, radon, all this other stuff you can throw on there. They they want to charge you for, um, you know, whatever you think is good for the property. But mainly I do about a four hundred dollar to five hundred dollar inspection in that range, so I get a better estimate of what's going on. Just because I'm never at my properties in person. So you, you want to take a look at uh, the inspection report when it comes back to you. Is it good or is it bad? Usually the inspection report will list everything that's wrong with the house. Hopefully there will be some major findings on there that will give us some negotiating room on repairs or final pricing or whatever they're going to pay our contractor when we close. So, you know, uh, like we talked about, you want your purchase agreement to be at a number that you're comfortable with on this house. Because if this inspector comes back and says, oh my goodness, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that house. That's the best house I've ever seen. You just wasted $500 on this inspection. So if that's what happens, then you have to kind of go ahead and uh, buy the house. So you can't come back at them with any type of repairs or whatnot. Um, and you're kind of stuck there or you'll lose your earnest money. So, you know, if we put in an offer of $140,000 on our house here and uh, we went ahead and the inspector came back and said, you know, that house is perfect. Well, then we're kind of screwed. So you want to make sure the number that you put in to begin with is good. Otherwise, you have to pass on the deal. Okay, so, uh, you know, then we come over to repair requests. Let's say that inspector said something like, oh, the furnace is old. Oh, the water heater's not useful. It's about to go. There's dangerous venting for something, water heater, furnace, anything else that would be vented. Oh, there's a big plumbing leak and it's causing damage in the crawl space or basement. You know, whatever they come back with there, you go ahead and put in a repair request. And you bring your realtor in for this and you say, hey, Mr. and Mr. Uh, buyer's agent, um, I have a couple repairs that need to be done on this property. So let's go ahead and put together an inspection addendum. So you put all this stuff together, like let's say, you know, I don't know, it needs a new roof, uh, it needs that shed, uh, like there's a pack of beavers living in there and you need to get the beavers moved out before your tenant can move in. Uh, you're going to go ahead and put that on there as a repair request. Now the thing about repair requests, if that owner doesn't want to do it, they don't have to. So, you know, that's why it's a request and not a repair requirement, uh, because you're already under contract for this house. You're within your inspection period. A little side note on inspection period there. You want to make it 14 days. If you can, make it longer. Make it as long as you can, because that's how long you have to back out of the deal. So here we go for the repair request. We're going to put in for this house, if it came back with bad roof, hey, we need that roof replaced. Um, and we, uh, if it came back that there's the pack of beavers building a dam in the shed, uh, we're going to go ahead and tell the seller that they need to have those beavers professionally relocated humanely uh, to a river nearby. And hopefully they don't return later on. But, you know, after closing, it's not really the seller's problem if they return. It's kind of your problem. So make sure that the, every, any pests or uh, rodents or whatever are moved out of the house before you close on it. Uh, so... Now, before we submit this over to them, you're going to want to go ahead and call the realtor or seller uh, that is uh, your contact over there for the house and get a verbal agreement to the repair requests. So you can kind of tell them, you know, it's better than just sending it over and writing, hey, I need a new roof. Hey, I need the beavers moved out. Um, you call them up and say, hey, yeah, so uh, my inspector came back and said that the roof really needed replaced. It's super old. Um, and that it could leak within the next uh, six months to a year. Usually an inspector will give you a time frame for how long you can expect that roof or whatever appliance or whatever fixture to last. And, you know, you tell them that you need to get that replaced. You don't really want to push them on it, but, you know, you have to put it in the repair request. Are they okay with that? 
you kind of explain it to them like that uh, verbally because it comes across a lot better rather than telling them they need to shell out seven grand to go to closing. So they'll usually agree to that or tell you something else is acceptable and you get that verbal agreement there. So you go ahead and send over the inspection addendum and they'll sign it. To do that, you call your realtor up and you say, hey, Mr. and Mrs. Realtor, uh, we need to go ahead and send them this inspection addendum. They've already agreed to everything. They should sign it within 24 hours and we'll be good to go for closing. So within that, uh, when you're talking to them about it, you're negotiating things. So if they say, no, I'm not repairing the roof, um, then you're kind of screwed. You can either back out of the deal uh, or say something like, well, look, you know, we kind of need some money off the house or we need some cash to go over to our contractor at closing. Uh, keep in mind, I'm not a lawyer. You need to make sure you do that legally because there are certain things that can get involved with your lending if they start throwing you cash uh, at closing. So make sure you take care of that. Talk to your realtor about it. Talk to the title agent or agency. Um, you know, I made a mistake last time calling it a title officer. I don't believe that's the correct term. It would be a title agent or a title agency, I believe. I could still be wrong, but go ahead and uh, correct me in the comments. I uh, really uh, would appreciate that. So you're getting this verbal agreement. Like, let's say they agree to $5,000 towards a roof, as has happened to me. And let's say they agree to, you know, cage the beavers and, uh, you know, move them to the back end of the property. So, okay, at least they got it moved out of the shed. Uh, so as long as you're good with that, um, you're going to go ahead and send that over to them. So, so far they need a new roof. We're going to get five grand for that at closing. Our contractor is going to go out there and estimate it. Uh, don't tell your contractor how much you're getting, uh, cause then they're just going to mark it up like, I don't know, a thousand bucks. So that, it, uh, you know, they're putting on a $5,000 roof for $6,000 and make an extra grand. You know, even if that happens, you're only paying a thousand bucks for a new roof that's going to last you 20 years. And if you go to sell this house in the future, you know, five years from now, you can say, hey, that roof was re replaced five years ago or repaired or whatever. Um, and the people buying your house will see that as a good value that they won't have to replace or repair a roof for the foreseeable future. So there we go. That's what we do on the inspection addendum. If that, all that works out, that's just examples of things that can happen. Uh, if there's a bad furnace, bad air conditioner, bad water heater, you can negotiate all that into there. Uh, and you're going to call them to get that verbal agreement beforehand before you submit it in writing. So keep in mind, we don't want to do anything verbally uh, for closing. We want to do verbal and writing. OK, the only reason we're talking to them about this is so that when that inspection addendum comes over and has twenty thousand dollars worth of repairs on it for whatever's wrong with the house, they're expecting it and agreeing to it or they'll deny it and send a counter offer and they're prepared for that. So that gives you the ability to negotiate at this point. This is where we're negotiating the price. OK, next slide. Okay, finalizing pricing. So with our repair requests, if those get accepted, we can either modify the purchase agreement to reflect a discount in the property. We can put in the inspection addendum that that homeowner will be paying somebody, hopefully our contractor, to go ahead and repair anything that's uh, wrong with the house. Um, and we're able to modify the purchase agreement at this point as well and resubmit it for signature. I've had purchase agreements be modified up to the week before closing, so it's not impossible and typically won't delay your closing date. So the other thing we're finalizing is cash from the seller to you, uh, or to me in this case, since I can't make any recommendations to you. It's a YouTube channel. Uh, yeah, I know it's, it's a YouTube, uh, but uh, we're, we're uh, only making recommendations for me here. Okay, so either that or your contractor is going to get a check at closing. Whatever's legal. Don't uh, just trust my word for that. Make sure that it doesn't violate any terms of your loan to have that contractor receive a check for repairs at closing. So if we get that house for $115,000 instead of 130, we know we're putting five grand into it for that half bath, probably less, but you know, let's just say five grand. Uh, let's say they give us $6,000 back at closing because they don't feel like dealing with the roof and they don't feel like dealing with the beavers hanging out in the shed. 
um, you know, we're going to go ahead and consider that a bonus because we can put a new roof on this house uh, and we can put a new bathroom in this house. If we have the same contractor do it, we'll probably get a discount and everything will be less expensive. So instead of spending five grand on a half bath, that contractor might say, hey, I'll do it for four or hey, I'll do it for three since I'm doing all this other work for you too. So you save a couple grand there. You know, it kind of goes both ways with money off of here um, and money back from the seller. If you're doing all that, you get discounts all around. So that's how you finalize the pricing there. And who knows, they might just want to drop the price of this house here uh, to 110000 just to make it good. You know, whatever whatever works out for you, they'll probably be willing to if the inspector finds something. They'll, they'll probably be like, oh, yeah, we can take it off price of the house. Oh, we can give you cash at closing for the contractor, blah, 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 blah. Whatever they work out. Either way, it saves you money. Uh, ideally, they're doing cash to the contractor and not taking it off the price of the house. We talked about uh, realtor fees earlier. Uh, if they're paying your realtor 2% and they take 10 grand off the price of the house, your realtor is kind of getting screwed on uh, $200 there. Uh, and it'd probably be better if they just gave you a check back to your contractor so your realtor gets paid. Keep all that in mind. You know, your realtor's thinking about this. He's, he or she's like, oh my goodness, they're negotiating the price of this house down. I thought I was going to make this much, and I'm not. So, you know, keep that in mind. There's no reason to lower the price of the house if you can legally and within the terms of your loan get cash back to somebody besides you for repairs. Or maybe they'll just go out there and fix it. If they fix it, good. Ideally, you want them to use your contractor, though, so that, number one, you get a discount on all the work. Uh, and number two, you know the work's good and you have somebody to call when there's a problem. If they pay some hack contractor to come out there and put a new roof on and it starts leaking after a year, who do you call? You know, you got to call them to get that contractor information and then you got to call the contractor and the contractor's like, who are you? I don't remember that house. So good luck getting your warranty work done. Try to have them use your contractor. Okay, that's it. That's it for finalizing pricing. Next slide. Second to last slide, finally. Okay, so we're going to negotiate pre-advertisement at this point. If there's not a whole lot of work to do in the house, you go ahead and uh, ask them, hey, um, can I go ahead and use your pictures that you have there on your listing and list this for rent? You'd probably do this about a week before closing. Uh, that, that would get you hooked up with some pictures so you don't have to go in there and take your own. You can't really use their pictures unless they give you permission. But if they give you permission, go ahead and remove uh, that advert that they have and put up your own rental advert as long as they agree to it. Ask them, hey, you know, the house is pretty good condition right now. There isn't much work I have to do. Would it be okay, but, you know, a couple days before closing, if I go ahead and show a couple tenants through there? And they'll probably say, yeah, yeah, cool, no problem. We, we ain't got nothing in there anyway. That house was vacant that we looked at, so they shouldn't have really any problem with that. So then at closing, you're going to want to make sure you get the keys as soon as you can take possession, because if you do all of this correctly, you could have a tenant ready to sign a lease and move in as long as there's not a whole lot of work that needs to be done to the house. Quickest I've done it is four days, I think, maybe three days from closing to having a tenant moved in. The main thing to do is make sure that tenant's rent check clears, uh, that initial check clears before moving them in. Because, you know, if they uh, move in there and, uh, you know, they decide to squat in the property like the beavers, then they really uh, can bounce that check to you. And it's going to take you two to three months to get them out of there because, you know what, you let them move in and now you have to actually evict them. That's a little tip for you there. Make sure that their uh, check clears. Okay, next slide. So Herbie, the seller of the house, uh, he wants to give you these keys, but before he does, he's going to try to kind of screw you on some things there. One thing Herbie will do is try to make verbal promises. Usually a realtor won't do this, but if you're talking to a uh, FSBO uh, owner of a house, they might say, hey, you know, I'll go ahead and uh, repair all of that before closing. Uh, there's no reason to put that in writing. That's just more stuff to e-sign, more trouble for us. So, uh, you know, just trust me. <laughs> so then you go ahead and close on the property. And what do you know? The roof's not cleaned off. That back deck wasn't cleaned off. And uh, the repairs that they promised weren't done. And, and what are you going to do at that point? You know, the money's already sent over to them. You had no idea that they weren't done. They promised they were. 
And, uh, you know, when you try to call them for it, next thing you know, uh, there's this little feature on a cell phone where they can actually block somebody's number. Next thing you know, it goes right to voicemail forever. So, yeah, don't accept verbal promises. Everything goes in writing. It's okay to have a verbal agreement on something prior to putting it in writing. But once you have a verbal agreement, you put it in writing and send it over to them for signature. Incomplete repairs. So, you know, you get into these repairs and sometimes there's just not enough time or that contractor kind of flakes out and disappears before closing. So the day of closing or the day before, you always want to do a walkthrough. If you're not local, then you ask your realtor or family member or property manager, whoever you're using, uh, to do a walkthrough of the property to make sure, number one, all the repairs were done, but number two, that nobody went and broke all the windows, the, you know, beavers haven't moved into the house now, you know, whatever. Uh, so once you do the day of closing walkthrough, this is before closing, so let's say the house got broken into and the people went ahead and left dirt and grime and trash and whatever everywhere in the house, you can go to the seller at closing and say, hey, you know, uh, that that's kind of messed up in there. Uh, you know, I guess nobody was really watching the house because it was vacant. We either have to handle that before closing or we're not closing on this property today. So you're able to refuse if there's something major like that. You're able to refuse to close and there's not really anything they can do about it or they're responsible to fix it. So if a house gets broken into and their insurance is going to pay for it, as long as you notice that before closing and they submit the uh, insurance claim, their insurance pays for it, not yours. You already have your own insurance at this point, but their insurance is still responsible for that until you get those keys. Okay, keys and locks. So here's the deal, people. Uh, you know, your uh, seller there is going to have a bunch of keys to this property. You might want to ask them, hey, when's the last time locks were changed? Hey, how many people out there have these keys? If they tell you, oh, yeah, you know, I never really changed the locks. I just got the keys back from the tenants. Well, those tenants could have gone and taken copies of the keys, made copies of the keys, given them to their friends, family, whatever, so they could get into the house. So what happened, and, uh, you know, you can check out uh, Chandler David Smith on this one, his channel over there. It looks, uh, you know, according to him, I think it was him, but one of these YouTubers out there had a situation where they went ahead and got the keys from the uh, owner and didn't bother changing the locks or changing the keys at all. And somebody that knew the previous tenant uh, didn't know that they had moved out. So the tenant that was living there at that time had uh, some people walk in that uh, had keys to the house. And that's kind of embarrassing if you're the landlord and all kinds of people have keys to your house and they're walking in on the tenant left and right. Imagine if that happened to you. So what you may want to do and consider this is either change the keys or change the locks. So there are locks out there. It's called a quick set smart key. You put those in your property, change out the locks. You know, it's not too expensive. Probably if you have two doors, probably a hundred bucks. If you have a garage door two, you're probably looking at 150 bucks for these uh, locks, these um, doorknobs and deadbolts. And what that lets you do is any key that fits in there, uh, you can rekey that within about 30 seconds so that the old key doesn't work and you don't have to change out the lock. Google those. Check those out. Those are pretty handy in a rental property. I change all mine out with that. And that's about it to be aware of. You know, there's other stuff that can come up, but watch out for those verbal promises. That's a really big one. Uh, incomplete repairs. Do that day of closing walkthrough. It'll really help you out and make sure everything's good. Yeah, there you go. So that'll do it on our three-part series. Wow. On uh, negotiating rental properties. Uh, check out, uh, I don't know, another video should show up right here. And there should be a little subscribe thing like, I don't know, over here somewhere. Hit that little thumb down below Herbie. Uh, I think Herbie's standing on it. You should be able to just click it down there. And, uh, you know, Stay tuned for the next one, everybody.